Well, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles tonight to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. And we'll also be looking at John's Gospel, chapter 20. Father, again tonight, I thank and praise you for the privilege of gathering together in this sanctuary again this evening. I thank you for each and every one that has gathered with us. And we're asking for the next few minutes of time that you would grant unto me, your servant, the ability to speak the word that you have put upon my heart. Once again, I'm asking, may the Holy Spirit go before us, prepare each and every one of our hearts, that we would receive with understanding what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. I ask it in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. First, we will look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and look at verse 21. I'm studying this portion of the scripture, the disciples, two of the disciples, after the crucifixion of Jesus, are walking on the Emmaus Road. They're talking, they're sad about what has happened, their hope has been shattered. Verse 20 said, 21. And we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. As I share this with you this evening, the Lord has been speaking to my heart about hope. Hope. There is times when we are, have hope for certain things. We're waiting on it, hoping about it. And then it doesn't happen. And our, show, our hopes are shattered. Let's consider this. I believe that the words spoken by the two disciples on the Emmaus Road were the sentiments of all the disciples and, and the followers of Jesus when Jesus was crucified. Now let's think about what I've just said. The disciples, 12 of them, that Jesus handpicked to follow him. They were with him for about three and a half years. They had given up everything to follow Jesus. They trusted him, they loved him, and they were believing. But they were believing for something different than what Jesus came. What is that, Pastor? Remember at that time, when Jesus was born and up to this present time that I'm talking about, they were under Roman rule. They were under Roman rule. So let's, let's think about what was happening in Israel when Jesus was born. Darkness, oppression, demon possession, cruelty by the Roman rulers. In other words, they were living in misery. They couldn't hardly do anything without the Romans being on them. They had to obey the Romans. The Romans would come through. Some of their soldiers would come through. If they saw something they wanted, they took it. And they could say nothing about it. Okay. They were mistreated. They were beaten. It was a horrible time to live. The people of, of Israel were really crying out to God for deliverance. Crying out. For deliverance. It reminds me of the day and hour in which we are living right now. Everything that's going on in our world tonight, the cruelty, the violence, the ungodliness, the immoralness, the hatred, the strife, the wars, the rumors of war, everything. The church is crying out unto the Lord. Even so, come quickly, Lord. I don't know how many times I personally have said, Lord, please come today. Let it be today. I've heard others say to me, Pastor, I'm just wishing the Lord would come and get us out of this. Okay. I believe that the children of Israel under Roman rule were crying out the same thing that they were seeking to get out of this. The people of Israel, again, crying out to God. I want us to hear that. Crying out to God. 
I ask you, in this day and hour as I've spoken, I wonder how many are here in this sanctuary tonight. You don't need to show your hands or anything because you know what your answer is. But I wonder how many are in this sanctuary tonight. I was just saying, Lord, I wish you would come. I wish you would come. Some saying, Lord, if you'd just come today. Some facing things that are going to be very trying for them and don't want to have to go through it. So they're crying, Lord, please come. Please come. That's what the children of Israel are doing at this set of time. Then, when Jesus began to preach and teach the gospel, many believed and followed him. Like the disciples that followed him. Many believed and followed him. They trusted in him. They saw the miracles that he did. Now let me just pause there and remind you of this. Not everyone that followed Jesus believed in Jesus. Not every one of them. They were following to see the miracles or following to hope to get a miracle themselves. But all of those that followed him and really believed in him were following him because they believed that he was who he said he was. When he chose his 12 disciples, as I said, they left everything to follow Jesus. I wonder tonight, in all of Christendom, if Jesus were to walk among us and point us out, various men out, you follow me. You follow me. I wonder how many in this day and age would give up everything they had to follow him just because he said, follow me. When I say that, I think of Matthew, the tax collector. When Jesus walked by him, he was sitting at the tax collector table, collecting the taxes, and Jesus looked at him and simply said, well, said follow me. Immediately he got up and left everything, left it laying there on the table and followed Jesus. I wonder, how many of us would do that? How many of us would really do that? They left all to follow Jesus. They left their wives, they left their children and took it to follow Jesus. They trusted him. And folks, I wanna remind you, read it. God never failed them. He took care of them, met all of their needs, blessed them and used them for his glory. Why? Why did they do that? When they saw all the miracles and the power of God on him, they believed that he was the deliverer of Israel. But again, they were believing him to be the leader. They believed that he was going to overthrow Roman rule and begin to give peace back to Israel. They were believing that. Folks, they had shattered hope. What is shattered hope? What does that mean? It means that when I have really set my heart on something and I'm hoping for it, okay? That word hope means believing for something that's happened that's going to happen. Believing that it's going to happen. Waiting faithfully for it. They believed that that was going to happen. Can you imagine then how they must have felt when they saw Jesus hanging on the cross? How do you think they felt? We hoped in him. We hoped that this was going to be. We hoped. Okay. How did they feel? Empty, alone, with no hope. His, their hope is hanging on the cross. No hope. See? They were hiding in fear of their lives. You see, when they came and arrested Jesus, took him away, the disciples were afraid that they would do the same to them. So they went off and hid in a house, shut all the doors and hid there, hoping that they wouldn't find them. That's where Jesus found them, 
and he walked through the wall to be among them. Listen then to these words. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 21. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, again. But we trusted that it had been he which had, should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Okay. There they are. Everything's gone as far as they're concerned. It's all gone. There's nothing left for them. Their hope has been shattered. Now what do we do? Now what do we do? But what? I ask you to think about some of these. I ask you to think with me for a few minutes tonight about Mary Magdalene. You talk about shattered hope. Mary Magdalene. Here is a woman whose life has been gloriously changed by Jesus, gloriously changed. Luke's Gospel tells us in chapter 8, Mary Magdalene, when, he, when, he, when Mary Magdalene first met Jesus, he cast seven demons out of her. Now think about it for a moment. Think of the life that she was living. Think about what she was going through. Her life was a shatters and torment. And she met Jesus. The devil's whole purpose, we need to hear and understand this, the devil's whole purpose is to destroy us. To destroy us. His purpose for Mary Miley, to destroy her. Think about the man of Gadara. Living on the island among the tombs. They had to drive him out of the cities because no one could tame him. He was demon-possessed, tormenting the people. They couldn't bind him. They put chains on him and he would break the chains asunder. They finally drove him to the island, the burial ground, if you will. And he was living in the tombs. He was miserable. The Bible said that he went about it trying to cut himself trying to commit suicide. He was miserable, tormented of the devil, without hope, no hope, nothing, until the day that Jesus pulled up to shore, stepped out of the boat. The man came running to him, asking him, what have we to do with you, Jesus? We know who you are. Jesus commanded and required, spoke to him, completely healed him. I love that story. I read it many times. When Jesus came, stepped ashore, the man was there, tormented, hot, totally naked. He didn't wear clothes. He was totally naked. There was a herd of pigs on the same island. When Jesus spoke to the demon. He asked him, what is your name? The demon answered and said, Legion, because we are many. So Jesus had come out of him. And they asked, the demons asked him, please, could we go into the pigs? Jesus released him to the pigs. The Bible said the pigs ran violently down the hill or into the ocean, choked themselves and died. The individuals had taken care of the, of the pigs went into the city and told the leaders and the owners of the pigs what had happened. This always amazes me. They came back to see what was going on. And they saw the man that had been demon-possessed, that had been out of his mind. They saw him clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now you would think, when they saw him, in that condition, knew what he was like, you would think that they would be thrilled, excited for him. But you know what they did? They asked Jesus, please leave. Please, we don't want you here. Please go away. They were afraid of him. But the man asked Jesus, could I go with you? 
Now I want to stop and ask you a question before I take this further. Where did Jesus get his first missionary? We look through the Bible, we think, well, probably Paul and Silas, maybe one of the disciples. Where did he get his first missionary? The man asked him, can I go with you? Let me go with you. Jesus said, no, I want you to go back to your city and tell all the people what the Lord has done for you. He went back and began to tell everybody in that city to Dicapolis, which means 10 cities. He went to every one of them telling them about Jesus. When Jesus came back later, the people ran out to meet him. The same people that asked him, would you leave? We don't want you here. When they heard what he had done and who he was, they came back and asked him for healing. They brought their sick to him. At first, they're without hope. Without hope. Folks, I wonder today how many in the world right now are without hope. Without hope. Lost without Jesus. How many? I ask you to think about that for a minute. You must have, I've thought many times, many times, even today when I was going over this again and reading it, I wonder what they really thought. Were they concerned more about their pigs than about their souls? Were they concerned more about their pigs than the young man that Jesus had totally healed and restored? What did they think? Whatever it was, it wasn't good because they wanted Jesus to go. They wanted him to go. So I ask you to think about it for a minute. Think again now about Mary Magdalene. Seven demons, possessed of seven demons. But that life of torment, that life of punishment, that life of wanting to kill herself, vanished when she met Jesus. When he came, he cast out the seven demons. She didn't want to leave him. Everywhere he went, she followed. She had other lady friends. They went with him and helped support Jesus from a life of suffering and torment to a life his life totally changed at peace, happy, and content. Okay. I ask you again to think about that man of Gadara, the torment that he went through for all of those years until Jesus spoke one word to him. He met Jesus. Okay. Every mission that Jesus attended, okay, there was results, miracles took place, lives were changed, individuals filled with the peace and the joy that only the Lord can give us, okay. Every mention of demon possession is synonymous with suffering and torment. When you hear anything about somebody that's demon-possessed, now, <clears throat> there was a time, it's changing rapidly, but there was a time that here in the United States, you have very seldom heard anything about demons. But now it's getting more and more. Okay. And all the things that we hear about demons, about being demon-possessed, lives are ruined, living in pain and suffering and torment, no hope, no hope, until someone tells him about Jesus. I've had some of the men at Teen Challenge tell me and tell, give their testimony that were demon-possessed. Some of the things they did, they don't even want to talk about them until they met Jesus. One story from one of the young men that I'll never forget. He was so 
tired of the life that he was living. He hated the way he was living. He hated what was going on in his life, but he couldn't stop it. One day, he decided he was going to commit suicide. I can't take this anymore. No hope, no hope whatsoever. He was going to a place to commit suicide. He came to a huge tree and he got to looking at it. He said, well, I could climb all the way up there and just topple over. That's what he was going to do. He climbed up into the tree, he got up as high as he could, and he was just sitting on the limb, thinking about just pushing off. And a man happened to come by. He looked up and he saw him. And he began to talk to him. Began to ask him, well, what are you doing? And he told him, I'm, I don't want to live anymore. I'm going to jump off of here and commit suicide. And the man began to tell wait a minute, let me talk to you first. Let me talk to you. He began to tell him about Jesus. What Jesus could do for him. Then he begged him, come on down here and, and just stand with me and talk to me a bit. He finally talked him down. He, could, he came and stood with him. In just a few minutes' time, he's crying out, accepting Jesus as his personal Savior. His testimony, look at me now. Look at me now. Okay. What does he do? He's working at one of our Teen Challenge Centers. Changed by God. Hope restored. Life worth living. Okay. That's, that's what Jesus does when we trust and believe upon him. So think again, Mary Magdalene. She stayed when they crucified Jesus. She stayed and watched it happen. She watched with a broken heart as Jesus was crucified. Nothing she could do but weep out brokenly. She followed and watched where they buried him in the tomb. So great was her love for Jesus. So I ask you, who was it? Who was it that is the first at the sepulcher? Jesus tells us in John chapter 20, verse 1. John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She wanted to go. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Okay. Peter, therefore, went forth, that the, and that other disciple came to the sepulcher. That's Peter and John. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. He came first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the other linen, linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first, that's John, came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. As yet they knew not the, the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Okay. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. But, and I love this, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. Now let me just pause there for a moment. I've wondered at first why Mary, knowing that he's dead, the tomb is sealed, why did she get up so early that morning? 
to go to the sepulchre. Maybe she just wanted to sit outside to be near. Maybe she wanted to talk to Jesus, even though he couldn't answer back. The Bible doesn't tell us why she went, but she went. See? So let us go on. But Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the, at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid them. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back. In other words, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the guardian, said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Now please listen to this. We find ourselves, if we find or when we find ourselves, in situations where, they, where we think there is no hope. There's no hope. No way I can make this happen. No hope. That's where Mary was. No hope. He's gone. She's heartbroken. But no hope. Now listen, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. And she turned her head and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. When he spoke her name, she recognized him and knew who he was. And I want to say to you tonight, when we find ourselves in conditions where there seemingly be no hope, nothing we could do, nobody else could do anything for us or help us, there's absolutely no hope. Call to Jesus. Call to Jesus. Like Mary did. Jesus said unto her, she ran to Jesus. She fell down to wrap herself around his legs. Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I, ascended into, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. I love that. She said, I have spoken to the Lord and he spoke to me. I want to say to you tonight, church, when we're in those situations, where we feel like there's no hope, nothing can be done, nobody else cares, Jesus does. When we cry out unto him, when Jesus speaks, he speaks like nobody else could. He speaks in love and in compassion. He touches your heart. Been there. Been there. Didn't hear an audible voice, but I knew in my heart, Jesus is answering. I've seen her in that condition and heard when Jesus would speak to her. Give her a scripture that just burns in your heart. He restores your hope. Hear me, he restores your hope. When you feel him, when you feel you're hearing him, he restores your hope and you know because you know because you know this is Jesus. It is Jesus. No one else could do that. Okay. Mary, she ran to him. And I dare say to you tonight, if you're going through something like that, and Jesus ministers to you, you also will want to run 
to him. Do you want to run to him? Mary's heart was rejoicing. She came back to the disciples. He's alive. He's alive. I talked with him. He's alive. Okay. Hope, joy restored. Just being in his presence. Hope and joy is restored. Again, again, the words of the disciples on the Emmaus Road express the feeling of all the disciples as Jesus reveals himself to them. Again, I would encourage you to read that. They're walking the road to Emmaus. They're sad. They're broken. They have no hope. We had hoped that this would be. That hope is shattered. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears walking with them. How well does he know us? He said to them, why is it you're walking this road and are so sad? He knew what they were feeling. He knew it. Why are you so sad? Then they started the conversation. Are you a stranger? Don't know what has happened? They go on to talk. Jesus walks with them. He has hidden their eyes to where they could not see and recognize him. They could see, but they couldn't recognize him. They went into a little restaurant to eat. Jesus went in and sat down with them. All the way into the town, he's expounding the scriptures to them. When he sits down at the table, he says something and poof, he's gone. Just gone. They got up. They went back. They, they had to tell somebody. They went back to tell the disciples. Their hope has been restored. He's alive. He's alive. When they get back to the disciples, they tell them what they have seen. And I love what they said about it. Talking to each other. Did not our hearts burn within us? As he spoke and expounded the scriptures. I ask you tonight, in times when you're seeking the Lord, maybe you're just sitting quietly reading your Bible. Maybe you're in the prayer closet praying. But if there, has there been times when you could just strongly feel his presence while you're there, while you're praying, while you're seeking him? Did your heart burn? Did you ask him, Lord, I want to feel like this forever. Please don't let this leave me. I want to feel it forever. Jesus, Jesus, he is our hope. I ask you, once again, think about it. Did your heart ever burn with a hunger and desire for more of him, to be closer to him? Were you going through something where you just had absolutely no hope over? Did you not wish to talk to him? I don't know how many times I've told my wife when I'm just reading my Bible or maybe doing some studying. And I say to her, I just wish I could talk to Jesus right now and have him talk back to me to where I could hear him in an audible voice. Have you been there? In his presence, it just causes a deep hunger in you to be closer, to reach out and touch him. Did not our hearts burn within us? What does it all mean to us today? Okay. The words of the song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, expresses it the best way. So I'm going to ask you, Brother David is going to lead us in the song. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me and let's sing it together. Because he lives, that, that church is our hope. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> 